like it's uh, cut class Thursday. We should have a pop quiz and give everybody 10 extra points. Does demand slow down or up? Uh, but you will benefit from being here, unlike your colleagues. Uh, by the way, speaking of uh, recording problems, somebody sent, sent me an email right before class. The lecture from Tuesday was only partially uploaded. Sorry, you can watch the first 13 minutes as many times as you want, but we'll try and get the other one fixed. Um, right, so logistics. Uh, we'll give you back your midterm at the end of the class. Your grades are already uploaded. I'll talk about uh, the class distribution of grades, whether or not your grade means you will fail or not, and uh, also go over some of the most common mistakes. I will also talk about uh, briefing one uh, as number five. I have a lot to say about briefing one. That'll be uh, one of your two briefings that you'll be doing uh, this semester. Um, and so I want you to know a lot of background on that, as well as I will give you the question that you will be writing the briefing on. Uh, this coming Friday, we're going to start, uh, we'll do, we're doing an experiment uh, in section. Uh, it will be for, the person who earns the most in the experiment will have three points added to their grade for this class. So you might want to go to the discussion session, not just to learn, because you will learn. It's an auction experiment, and it will be interesting, I guarantee it. Uh, but also because uh, you might end up getting some extra points. So it's Friday, Monday, Friday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday. We're running it. This, the section schedule sucks, you know, because, you know, we do something on Thursday, and the Friday section is like, hey, let's have a party. And the Monday section didn't have a party. So I, I'm trying to run sections in terms of, like, Friday through Wednesday is one topic. And then starting again on but, but anyway, we might have to do something around uh, Thanksgiving around that, but I'm not sure how to do that right now. Uh, oh, and I also uh, read through all of your comments on um, what did you like about the class, what do you not like about the class, what is still confusing with you, uh, for you, and um, what's the good thing, what's the excitement, or whatever that you picked up. So I want to go over some of those things just now. Um, because it's important that we all agree on things, or that at least you, that, that at least that you know that I know what you know that I should know, uh, to use our game theoretic expression. So uh, I got a lot. There was a lot of nice comments in terms of the lectures being interesting. I'm glad. I spent every morning practicing my jokes before I come in here, uh, and my mirror doesn't laugh, so I'm glad that you do. Um, there were some, it, it was some interesting comments. There were half, it, I'm not going to say half of people said this and half of people said that, but a lot of people said, I love it when you go off on a tangent and you rampage about stuff. And a lot of people say, I hate it when you do that. So obviously, you know, you can't please all the people. And I, I of course, love going on rampages. Except that they are not actually tangential. They are of impact. If I started talking about how to make yogurt, that would be tangential, right? So uh, when I go off and I start talking about political economy stuff, remember, this is a policy class, right? This is not pure economics. And I realize that I have particular opinions and ideas, and I'm happy on the CSR stuff. We'll talk about it later. The CSR is a very hot topic for a lot of you. And uh, so we can argue over things, and there's, your grade is not going to depend on agreeing with me. That's important, okay? But learning economics and applying economics means that when we have these arguments, even if they seem tangential, they actually might be important in terms of what you take out into the world, which I keep, I keep telling you, this is about the world, not about uh, this ivory tower textbook kind of theoretical stuff. So um, I don't intentionally go off on tangents and rampages, but it's just one of those things. And uh, and I'm, I'm happy, to, I'm, I'm trying to make them applicable, obviously, to your class. Um, I pay a lot of attention to what you guys did not like, uh, so I, I took a lot of notes on uh, what do you not like. Uh, one person, I think many, many people mentioned that it was hard to connect the lectures with the midterm or with the homeworks. Um, the good news is you won't really have to worry about that because we're not going to have, we only have one more homework left and we'll try and be more prompt on it. As well as you'll have more than adequate time to prepare for the final. Okay? Remember there's this RRR week before the final. So uh, the final's on the 10th, I think, of December. And the last, oh, I have the calendar here. The final's on the 15th and our last lecture 
The last class is on the 8th, which is a week before, and even that class is a review class, okay? So, unfortunately, you didn't have as much time to go over the review materials and review sessions before the midterm. You will not have that problem for the final exam. I do want to point out that the review materials that the GSI has prepared to you were completely uh, extra, bonus, on their own initiative. I didn't ask them to do that, and so they just did it. So, unfortunately, it should have arrived a week earlier, but... We all have constraints, and all of you were screwed equally in that sense, so I'm sorry about that, but um, hopefully, in terms of connecting the lectures and the homeworks and the midterms, you'll be able to learn from the keys. I know that's too late. You're worried about your grade. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I found that I always learn when I make mistakes, and I rarely learn when I get things right. So um, if we're interested in the whole process of am I learning or not, then um, at least the bright side is that when you get something wrong, you should be able to learn from it. Um, so that's my little thing about the connections between the material. Uh, as usual, we're doing the best we can, so uh, it's not an intentional, uh, and I know you guys don't think it's intentional. We're trying to do what we can. Math. Everybody hates math. You know what? I hate math, too. And, and also, they're like, you're covering too much material too fast, and you go along, and I'll get into my disorganized stuff, don't worry. But um, this class, unfortunately, is a bridge class, and I was told, you have to cover all these topics. Right? And this is a semester, it's not a quarter, right? So I'm trying to pile, like, if you look at the syllabus, there's, like, so many topics. It's, a, it's the table of contents of a, of a textbook that's that thick. So, uh, unfortunately, that means I can't spend as much time on one thing as I want to. You might take an upper division class that's all about um, public goods, for example. Or you'll take one on industrial organization, only for 16 weeks, right? Unfortunately, I'm supposed to skate across the top of all these topics and leave the depth to your later classes. Right? So that means that sometimes I'm sacrificing um, quality for quantity, and I'm, I, am, I am trying to get it across. Now, a lot of people are saying, you go over stuff too fast, and I don't get it, and then you keep going. And I have to recommend to you that you use this thing called an arm, right? Okay, so you raise your hand. And I'm going to do it. We're going to do a class exercise right now. I'm going to write the, the text on the board, and this is one of those repeat after me. And I'm going to write clearly so you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> That's the preamble. Okay, so, everybody, get your hands in the air. Get your hand in the air. Repeat after me. Yo! Yo! Dude! Dude! I don't get it! I don't get it! Alright, now that you know... How to raise your hand and how to say yo dude. I am going to trust that your responsibility as adults over the age of 18, capable of entering into contracts, not necessarily capable of drinking, uh, legal drinking, that you will say something, okay? Do you have a question? No? Okay, good practice. Okay, so um, now that covers a. Yeah. Yo dude, um, why is weed for thinkers? Why is weed for thinkers? Yeah. That's a long thing to talk about. Let's step outside. Uh, <laughs> let's just say, let's just say this way. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, this is an aside, but it's an interesting aside. Uh, the whole idea of, of banning something that everybody does is a really dumb idea, right? So the U.S. had, pro uh, not prostitution, we had prohibition in the 1930s. Uh, we had prostitution also in the 1930s. But prohibition did not succeed because everybody liked drinking alcohol, right? Um, or a lot of people do. Um, and the drug policy, I, I, I point out to you that every culture has religion, every culture has drugs, and drugs essentially are a way of altering your consciousness, right? Whether or not it's Xanax, right, or coffee, or Coke, Diet Coke, I mean, the drinkable Coke, right? Whatever it is, people are trying to alter their consciousness, and sometimes um, it has beneficial uh, impacts. So, um, I'm one of those true believers. Um, so, I got comments such as the follows. It's hard to focus on what you're t t teaching. What the hell are you teaching? Uh, can you do lecture notes ahead of time? Um, uh, let's see here. Can you give us an outline? You're going too fast. Um, you're teaching uh, a top. Oh, can you teach everything at once? Right? Can you just give us everything at one time on one topic? So that we don't have to worry about, like, oh, is this covered across three lectures? Um, it's hard without a textbook. Um, 
why do we have unnecessary reading? And you're too free market. So let me respond to <laughs> I will respond to these things in turn, right? Um, I already told you I'm trying to cover a lot of topics, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is kind of one of those, I, I am doing a constrained optimization, okay? If I spent the entire time talking about water, I would be happy, right? You guys would be happy, I would be happy, you all be happy. But your professors in the next class would be very unhappy, right? Um, so, the, my handwriting sucks, you already know that. And I, I prepare lectures and I, and I go off my notes and I, I talk extempore. So I don't write down <coughs> lecture notes. If you actually had to look at this, as opposed to my writing on the board, which is actually slightly better, then it might be worse, right? But um, the good news is that, uh, Brenna, where's Brenna hiding here? There she is. She's uh, the one who, who got the job for transcribing the lectures, okay? If you want to read 25 pages per lecture, eventually it'll show up. Unfortunately, we have a little lag, right? So um, those lecture notes will be posted, uh, or they'll be actually, they'll be simul, simulcast, simul simultaneously linked to the videos, so you can actually watch, watch subtitles if you're watching the videos. That might be a little bit late as far as you guys are concerned, which is like, I want to read the lecture notes before your class, which is what everybody always wants, or I want to read the lecture notes in the afternoon. But we're doing something. In the meantime, um, I think I have no choice but to continue with business as usual, so I'm sorry about that. I also know that there's this, there's this thing, if, if, you do chalk, if you do chalk and talk compared to doing PowerPoint, you know, even fewer people show up because they, oh, the video, the PowerPoint, I don't have to go to class anymore, right? So, uh, besides PowerPoint really sucks because then you have to get through every slide. Have you ever been to a presentation where someone has 50 slides in 20 minutes? And they're like, oh, I'll just get through these things. Just, just hold on. Did you see that? Oh, that was good. Okay, and they just keep going through the slides, right? Because there's some kind of human compulsion to get to the end of things, right? And so, I actually don't mind stopping in the middle of my notes and starting the material off in another class. And, and hopefully that's serving you despite the fact that it's slightly disorganized. I go too fast, I heard that one. Um, the, I told, I warned you in some ways ahead of time that I would be disorganized and that I would be covering topics in layers, okay? You'll hear about things several times. Hopefully, it is developing the intuition. Remember, intuition is not something you're born with in economics, right? Intuition is what you learn by repeated exposure. And more importantly, the reason that I'm uh, assigning these briefings and these blog posts and all this stuff is so that you can actually try and put a whole thought together, right, on a topic and have it appear in public and have people uh, comment on you. The blog posts are still going up. Some really amazing comments from people uh, in the community. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that in the combination of my scatter, scattershot approach and you having to make a concrete uh, 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 exposition on a topic that you'll be learning the economics on. Okay. And because of the, the blog and because of the way that you'll be doing uh, peer, peer grading on the briefings, you will uh, be cluing in on how to present an argument from A to Z, uh, despite the fact that I don't necessarily do that in lecture. Um, I, will try, I will try and write down the key points. Someone said, can you highlight the key points? Can you write the definition down? But some of these definitions, you know, I, I will say this is a public good or whatever. Some of these definitions are very flexible, like sustainability. I mean, it means everything to everybody, right? My definition of sustainability is not going to be in someone else's uh, textbook or their class. So I'm trying to give you a, a feeling for what these things mean so that uh, at least you have an intuitive idea of what that means. And remember, back to intuition, it's what you learn over time. Uh, people that want a textbook, go buy a textbook. It's in there. This is like completely conventional microeconomics, besides my rampaging about political economy and corruption, which is completely conventional newspaper reporting, right? If you want a textbook, you can go get them. They're all over the place. They're, you could buy pretty much any micro textbook published after 1980, <coughs> so, if I can tell, okay? so if it, if you can get it for $1.22 on Amazon. You can check it out of the library. All those things are fine. And I completely recommend, I actually, I think you should just go to Wikipedia. Screw the textbook. If you want to know about Increasing returns to scale, go look at Wikipedia, right, if you're confused about that. Um, and I didn't assign a textbook, but you always, it's, it's optional, it's not mandatory, right? Uh, but you, if you want to have one, go ahead and get one. Um, okay. And math, math, math. I'm sorry about the math. I mean, uh, the, I, like I said, if I could throw, throw out math, I probably would, right? The whole idea of constrained optimization and derivatives and Lagrangians and stuff like that. It's, it's not critical to, to economic understanding as far as I'm concerned, but it's critical to success in your later classes. So, unfortunately, this is for your own good. Now, what are you confused about? 
everything. I, everybody wrote everything. I have, there's, there's, there's monopoly math, Leontiev production functions, deadweight loss, math versus reality, scale and scope, uh, Edgeworth boxes, opportunity cost and learner, I mean, let's just do it again, <laughs> right? So, um, if you're confused about a particular topic, I suggest that you obviously go look it up, you come to office hours. You know, I know that the vast majority of people say, well, that's too late. I already took my midterm. Midterm is not cumulative. I will rationally, as a student, go forward and whatever. If I really need to know that, I'll learn it in the future. I do suggest that you form a study group, right? If there's four or five of you and one person doesn't get it, then the other people can explain and vice versa. Gains from trade, okay? Act like economists for a minute and go do that. Right? It requires that you talk to people next to you. It requires that you actually take time to go do things. You could uh, make it easier by having donuts and coffee. Okay? So uh, study groups, there's nothing better than learning from your peers. Because I guarantee that almost all of you, collectively you know everything. Right? But as individuals you don't know everything. And so you can e exchange with, from each other. And I, I, just, I just recommend it. It's, it's always, always works in any kind of school environment. It's, it's an obligatory graduate school. I could never have survived graduate school if I wasn't in a study group or many study groups. So if you haven't already started doing study groups as part of your uh, education, I suggest you do it. Um, there's this notion of teamwork that happens to matter in society, and I'll get to teamwork in a second, but uh, you know, it's, it's really worth it, okay? And I'm going to leave that to you guys to figure it out. There's, there's, a, there's a, a forum on the B space where you can say, hey, I want to have a study group. Someone put, someone put one up for... Uh, study groups for the final, right? Start now, right? Because all this material is going to the final. Why not have the final study group right now? Right? And by the time you get to the final, you'll actually like each other. So, or you'll know what everybody's foibles are. Um, there was a confusing comment to me. People were saying, oh, there was stuff on the problem sets and the midterms that were not covered in the lecture. And that's kind of um, not what I thought. And so, uh, in terms of a sneak attack uh, question that wasn't in the lecture, I, I, was, I was trying to avoid that. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but, um, and then again, everybody is, you know, screwed exactly in the same way. I, actually, I know that the problem that was definitely not in the lecture was the, the cost curve question on the, uh, on the midterm. Um, that, of course, was using material from the lecture, so I was counting on your creativity to answer that. I'll get to that particular question later. So, um, you know, sometimes I would brush over it in the lecture, but it would be extensively covered in the homework. And you will have noticed that some of the midterm questions were very similar to some of the problem set questions. That was intentional because we wanted to see that you learned from your mistakes or that you were still getting it right. So um, I am very uh, worried about testing you on things that I have not prepared you for, or at least I have not said that you should be prepared for. And so I'm sorry about that for people that feel like um, they were double-crossed. Uh, and what's, what's good, a lot of good, good comments about, you know, I like this class because it's connected to the real world, or let's do more game theory, or let's do more case studies. And as I mentioned um, in the last lecture, I, I can't wait to do that I also. So that's, those are my brief comments on uh, the, the feedback from you guys. Uh, it's my, my, main, my main conclusion is that I want you to interrupt me when you don't get it, okay? Be brave. There's no problem. If you raise your hand, I guarantee there's five people that really should be raising their hands with you, okay? Yes? Raise your hand if you agree. Okay, it looks like we're all in agreement. That's good. I love dictatorship. Just kidding. Okay, so uh, open question. Any open questions? Q&A, any open questions, stuff? Oh my god, I wish I... No? Okay. Let's go to principal agent economics, uh, or principal agent model. So, this is jargon. And it's really, really, really important in terms of understanding, essentially, uh, non-market, uh, non perfect So, let me start, start again. How often do we have perfectly competitive markets in the real world? What percentage of the time? Who thinks more than 10% of the time? Who thinks less than 10% of the time? Who thinks less than 5% of the time? Let's just keep it around there, okay? Not very often. So if you don't have perfect competition, then 
a you, there's there's going to be some notion of profits, okay? So the whole idea is that perfect competition will drive profits to zero, okay? But if we don't have perfect competition, then profits are greater than zero. And essentially, what that means is that um, the social welfare is not maximized. Okay, we're basically just talking about um, if we're talking about a typical supply and demand situation. This is what we have. We've maximized social welfare. This triangle here. We maximize when we have perfect competition. If we don't have perfect competition for whatever reason, we're going to have a dead weight loss. Fine. But the, the, the key is, is that because there's not perfect competition, there's some form of, um, let me say it a different way, let me draw it. That's socially, but remember the individual firm in perfect competition, um, I did it wrong. The individual firm in perfect competition is a price taker, right? The individual firm is uh, you're going to be getting some kind of profit based on uh, the difference between their costs and the, and the market price. Okay, so they'll be getting the surplus. In perfect competition, this surplus surplus gets driven to zero. Right? We <coughs> that. If they have some market power, though, they're going to be getting uh, a bigger share. They're going to be getting some share of the consumer surplus. Right? Which is going, which is essentially because they're going to face a downward sloping demand curve, and the idea is to price discriminate and get a piece of the action, right? I'm just kind of vaguely drawing some pictures, and, and but I'm referring to the idea that monopolies make some profit. You guys understand that, right? Okay. Now, the political economy of monopolies and profit is that you would want to figure out some way of increasing your market power so you can get the profit, right? And some, and what you're willing to do is you're willing to risk some of that profit. You're willing to use some of that profit to get market power. The most traditional way is for a company to go to a politician and give a bribe to get some market power, right? That means that I go to the politician and they create a law that uh, benefits my particular company or my particular industry. That's the political economy of uh, market power. So what happens is the monopolist says, hey, look, if you give me monopoly power, I will make a surplus off of the citizens and I, will, and I will share that surplus with you as a campaign contribution. You can find this pattern repeated over and over and over again worldwide. So the politicians are, and the, and the industrialists if you want, since, since Adam Smith pointed this out and since before then, right, they have in some ways conspired against the people. And you know, that's my free market capitalist perspective, right? So the fact, if that fact is happening, <coughs> means that um, because that's happening, we're dealing with people that have discretion. People are getting to do, they're making choices on what they want to do. They're not forced to do what they want to do. And by this I mean that the monopolists have a discretion about how much quantity to, pursue, to pr produce, right? The monopolist will cut back on quantity to raise the price. You guys remember that, right? From the whole idea of working up the marginal revenue curve. If you don't remember that, I'm drawing you the, the picture here. The monopolist will choke back quantity the QM in order to raise the price and make a monopoly profit. Okay, remember that? All right. So because the monopolist has choice, the monopolist has discretion on how much to produce. That will that that means that what is going on in the monopolist's head matters. Now, why is this? And I'll connect this to principal agent. This is why I'm, what I'm getting to. Believe it or not. What happens in the monopolist's head matters. What happens in the politician's head matters, right? If it's perfect competition either on the economic side, the firms are perfectly competing so they have no monopoly power, or there's perfect competition on the political side, monopolists don't have discretion to hand out pork, then what happens is they just do their job. The monopolists will produce the goods and sell them at a, at a market clearing price, they'll be price takers, and the politicians will just do their job because if they don't, then voters will very efficiently elect them out of office and replace them with someone fresh and new. We know that that doesn't happen either on the economic side or on the political side, right? On the economic side, the monopolist has the capability of choosing how much to produce in order to get those monopoly rents. On the political side, politicians have discretion 
on how to do their job that gets them rents as politicians, right? And, we're, and I'm saying that they're, they're going to deviate from their job, which is to serve peop the people, the citizens, their constituents, and in order to serve themselves, themselves, okay? This is what is behind principal agent economics, okay? What's behind principal agent economics is that people have choices whether or not they want to do their job as advertised or do their job which serves themselves, okay? This falls, the whole idea of public servants The whole idea of public servants <coughs> serving themselves is <coughs> in economics called public choice, right? Here's your definition. Um, they serve themselves, not their boss. Okay? And that's a broad definition, and I and I, I like it being broad like that because a pol who's the boss of a politician? We, the voters, are the boss of the politician, right? A government of, by, and for the people, right? Who's the boss at the, uh, or who's your boss when you work at the coffee shop? The owner of the coffee shop. If you serve yourself and you drink extra coffee, or you take money out of the till, or you give free coffee to your friends, or you decide that you can let someone wait because you have to finish your phone call. If you serve yourself instead of serving your customers, then you are falling under that category called public choice economics, right? But it's most often applied to bureaucracies, to government, to <coughs> bureaucracy, and politics. Now the, where was I somewhere? I was, um, you know, it's when you go to the post office and you're sitting there waiting to send a package or whatever, and so-and-so is just chit-chatting with the customer. Because like, hey, how's it going? Oh, the weather's fine. Oh, my, my leg really hurts. They're sitting there having a conversation. You're like, dude, i got to get to class, right? But they are in a bureaucratic forum. They face little competition. They're the post office. They know that, number one, you have to wait, and number two, they're not going to get fired, right? And in a sense, what happens is it establishes a culture, in a way, I'll get to your hand in a second. It establishes a culture of indifference. Because what does happen is if you come in there and you're a go-getter, it's like, you know, like, serve the people, serve the people, serve the people. After a while, your co-workers, <coughs> like, they start uh, being nasty to you. Right? There's some really interesting uh, economic research or sociological research on this. And it's like, do not, uh, I'm senior here and you do not work that hard because it's going to make me look bad. Right? And that happens. I've heard that stuff happen. It's really ridiculous. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you could give a definition of principal agent. I will in a sec, yeah. yeah. In fact, I'll give way too many definitions. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, I had a question on, um, I guess like, because I know they're really different, but like, so I guess there's like a link between bureaucracies and monopolies. Because it's like, yeah. bureaucracy is actually a monopoly. That's right, right. So a monop monopoly power is dangerous uh, on either side, politics or economics, right? And uh, we don't think we don't dis discuss government as a monopolist very often, but they really are, right? So in the water business, I say this all the time: the problem in the water business is not a private water provider or a public water provider. The problem is they're both monopolies, <coughs> right? So either way, they have discretion on how much they want to do in terms of doing their job, right? So the question is, how can you bring competition to a monopoly? That's for me, like as an overriding research agenda, I'm always interested in doing that: how to bring competition to a monopoly. Okay. So you have this problem of public choice, which is that you're going to serve yourself and not your boss. Let's, let's at, uh, write this down in a, in a semi-formal definition, or just to write it in, in our utility function. Your utility is a function of what? It's the, it's the, the goods that you consume, right? The, this, this X, all of these goods. And, um, let's see here. I'm just going to call this, um, I'm going to put the letter alpha here, or the Greek letter alpha here. And let's call this alpha, and the definition of this is going to be something along the lines of intrinsic, intrinsic what? Motivation. Motivation, right? So the goods you consume 
you get them because you have your income M, and your income M is you, you, you work for your income, right? You're extrinsically motivated, right? You guys are working for grades. Once you graduate, you work for income. It's like it's one of those another brick in the wall kind of analogies, you know? It's like your your entire life you're growing up. I gotta get grades. I gotta, I gotta get salary. I gotta get salary. You know? It's like so you're actually motivated by this extrinsic stuff. But there's an intrinsic motivation, which is kind of what makes you happy, regardless of the of the financial or grade uh, requirements, right? So. Uh, there was a question on the midterm about intrinsic motivation, but the idea was that uh, uh, when you wrote your blog post, it, you knew that you could just hand in something. It could be crap for 10 points. But if you were going to do more than just crap, more than the minimum, you would do it because you, you, it made you feel good to write something good about something you cared about. That's intrinsic motivation. And when we look at this public choice question, when we talk about bureaucrats or politicians, and you say, why are you in it? The politicians are like, because I love to serve the people, right? And a lot of politicians start off that way. A lot of people who go to medical school say, I want to be a doctor because I want to heal people, right? Or lawyers. I want to go uh, help, uh, I want to do pro bono work and help the community. I want to fight for righteousness or whatever. And then there's this classic problem called, you graduate with $200,000 of debt, right? But those people are talking about intrinsic motivation. I told you at the start of the semester that I'm getting, I'm getting paid a salary to teach this class and they're taking it away out of my other salary. So I'm teaching it for, for zero, right? Because I want to teach. It's intrinsic motivation, right? I put in effort. I could just sit here and say, here's the slides I copied from the textbook. Write that down and class is dismissed, right? I could do that. But I don't. Because I actually care about you guys learning, right? There's a lot of things that you do in your life that you do because you care about. I mean, you can call it love, right? You can you look at how you look at your hobbies, right? Why do you have that hobby? Because I love to do it. Why do you spend 16 hours, uh, you know, or why do you uh, spend whatever spend 16 hours making a widget that you can buy at the store for 12 for for a dollar, right? Because I like doing that. People that knit, right? People that bake bread at the house. <coughs> People that um, whatever. I like I was I was a renter and I was cleaning the gutters on the house that I was renting. That doesn't. I have no long term payback, but I like the gutters to be clean, right? So that was intrinsic motivation. You guys have, I'm sure you've imagined examples for yourself. So when it comes down to the public choice, we're talking about serving yourself. And if you're a, a bureaucracy or a bureaucrat or a politician, you're getting your salary almost no matter what. Okay? And then the question is, do you want to serve the people? Well, maybe serving the people <coughs> will take effort for me. Right? I have to say after 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Or I have to think during the day. Or I can't take my three coffee breaks. Right? And maybe you want to do that, and so you do do that. There are plenty of people who do. And there's, but the thing is, there's plenty of people who don't, and there's no market discipline. There's no market discipline to punish them if they do. So that's why we witness this more often in monopolistic situations, whether it's the market or the, the politics, right? We witness people who are just basically serving themselves and not doing their job. Competition makes people do their job, because otherwise they'll lose their job. So that's, in a sense, you know, we still have the same thing going on in our head. It's like, oh my god, I better go. I better go do my homework. It's due, otherwise I'll fail. Or I better go to work today, otherwise I'll get fired. Right? So that's because of competition. If you're not going to get fired, you're like, eh, I'll go to work later sometime. Okay? So that's the dynamic that's going on. It's that balance between, um, you know, the explicit rewards, um, which maybe you're getting already, or you're not, because you'll have some discipline, and how you feel inside yourself. When it comes down to public choice. The basic observation is, just because you're elected to do your job, or just because you're appointed as a bureaucrat to do your job, doesn't mean you're going to do your job, right? <coughs> it's really like, whoa, that's not very profound, except that it was, right? The theory of the firm, remember, is that the firm is this, this big monolith, and the board of the firm will be bigger or smaller based on, you know, should I buy my supplier, or should I, you know, my, I should, should I vertically integrate or not? But if you get inside the theory of the firm, which is what Oliver Williamson did, you start looking at the transactions costs of people interacting with each other, and essentially a firm is a bureaucracy, right? You've got the CEO, the CEO tells the, the vice presidents what to do, the vice presidents tell the division managers what to do, the division managers tell the, the line workers what to do, line workers go take a lunch break, right? Well, they don't, right? Has anybody read Dilbert, right? If you understand, if you worked, or if you worked in an office, right? Then you understand, like, there's this guy Wally in Dilbert, and he just walks around the coffee cup all day. He just drinks coffee all day. And he never gets fired. Because he's just like, whatever. 
and then the manager says, you should work. He's like, yeah, whatever. <coughs> or, or you know, send me an email, and I'll read your email, and then I won't respond to it, and I won't be working. Right? So it's like there's kind of crazy Dilbert existences that, that you will run into at some point that is what happens when you get inside of the firm, when you get inside of the bureaucracy, and you witness this interplay between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Trust me, this is all over the place. Now, that's public choice. How does that relate to principal agent? It's the exact same thing, except now I'm going to use more jargon. This is the philosophical background of principal agent economics. So, here's a, here's a, a typical example. You've got a principal, and you've got an agent. The principal has a house to sell. Hires a real estate agent. Right? The principal could be selling this to selling a house. The principal might have an investment portfolio. Who would, who would the agent be in an, with an investment portfolio? Stockbroker, right? Or um, you know, you, ha you want to get your house painted, you hire a agent who is a house painter, right? Or I am the lecturer and I have who are my agents? GSIs, right? Or uh, I pay money to the uh, university, and then I'm going to go to the food hall and get food from who? The workers who theoretically care about the food I'm eating, right? They're getting paid no matter what, and you have, and that's the food that you get, right? Those food workers at the dorms. I don't even know if there are, are there food. Is there food at <coughs> dorms? Is that, is that the right a good example? Those food workers at the dorms are your agents. They should be doing the best possible job to give you the best food for your money. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you better go down the street, right? So this principal-agent relationship is repeated over and over and over again. And the principal thing is that there is a relationship of trust and what's called asymmetric... Asymmetric what? Information, right? Because essentially... You have to, you don't know two things about the agent. You don't know the agent's ability, and you don't know that the effort that they're going to put into their job, to doing the job. This is very important, these two things. This is part of your definitions. And I'll give you the, the horrible jargon that we use for those two words. You don't know, if you hire a real estate agent or you hire a house painter, you're like, well, let's see, uh, you have a shiny car, so you must be pretty good at selling houses. Or um, you have a, a truck that has paint cans on the side of it, so you must understand what, what painting is about. But then after you hire them, then they have to actually put in the effort, right? They might have all kinds of ability, but they might be lazy and not even do any work, right? So you need them to have not just ability, but you need them to put in effort. <coughs> to do the job. And the problem is, is that you don't necessarily know what ability they have. They know. And you don't necessarily know what effort they're putting in, but they know. Is there usually some kind of like review system where you can find out about, like, for example, a real estate agent or something, what how good they are? Right. You can find out how good they were in the past in terms of effort, or how much ability they have in terms of total sales. But when it comes down to you and your sale, you usually can filter out for ability, right? But effort is hard. But this is so this is a key component. The I'll I'll, I'll preview essentially the solution to principal agent problems is repetition, right? Repetition in the sense that um, if you hire somebody to mow your lawn, you say, look, you have a lawn mower, you have ability, right? And I have a lawn, right? And I hope you put in effort, and I'll pay you. This money, but you don't, for a lawn, you don't pay dollars per hour necessarily, do you? You say, I'll pay you 10 bucks to mow my lawn. Because if it's dollars per hour, it might take 12 hours to mow that lawn. So there's this problem of incentives. So you say, I'll pay you 10 bucks to mow the lawn. Good deal or not? Yes, good deal. Okay. They mow the lawn, and it's crap. They do a crap job. They put in no effort. When you go around to hire them next week, what are you going to do? You're not hire them or tell them, 
I'm not paying you anything, you have to fix it or whatever. So the repetition is very important. Repetition in a way is like competing with your future self. That's a kind of type of competition, right? That's why ele elections are held more often than a lifetime for a politician. Because you want to be able to grade them on their job. But, I mean, there are a lot of examples where that doesn't work because if you have a lawyer or a doctor doing major surgery on you, you're not going to have you a be second <laughs> Or you're going to lose the lawsuit and then that's it. Right. So, so, so if you, yeah, so the, the, the repetition, so lawn mowing is a very simple repetition, but these other big questions are harder, right? My, I used to be a real estate agent, my father still is, and there's this crazy thing. Why are real estate agents paid 6%? Commission, right? If you have a house that sells for four hundred thousand dollars, there's going to be two agents, one on the buy side and one on the sell side. They're going to get twenty-four thousand dollars of commissions, which for some people is like their annual earnings, right? They'll get that on that one sale. And there's this really curious thing: why do they get so much money? In some ways, it's because it's so important. That sale is so important for the buyer and the seller that they really are willing to pay a whole bunch of money to get a good person to do it, right? Because I can go and say, oh. They're doing 6%, I'll do it for 2 And then if you're the seller of that house, you might be thinking, hmm, 2%, is he actually going to do a good job? Right? So there's this, and that's actually called efficiency wages. This is more jargon, right? Efficiency wages. That basically means that W is greater than W star. You pay more than the market clearing price for your, for your agent. The reason you pay more than the market clearing price is because, number one, not necessarily because you want them to do a careful job, because they can do a crappy job, but number two, if they do a crappy job, they're never going to get hired again, right? So the idea is that if you're going to, if you do a good job, that that person will recommend you to your friends, if, you're a, if, it's, a, if it's a lawyer or a real estate agent, you don't sell houses every week, right? But if you do a good job, if you're the agent and you do a good job, then you'll get recommended. If you do a crappy job, then you'll get uh, trounced, right? And the, the idea of efficiency wages is, if I do a good job, the, the, the principal offers the efficiency wages. I will pay you, so say that the going rate is 10 bucks an hour. And I say, I'll pay you 20 bucks to do something. You'll be like, wow, great. Now, but it's very explicit, or implicit if you want. If you do a crappy job, you don't get to work next week, right? You might make 20 bucks an hour for, for this week, but next week you won't make any money at all. You'll be fired, right? But if you do a good job, then you get paid week after week after week. So in a sense, it is efficient for you to put in the effort because you don't want to get fired, right? And with real estate, it, it can be like that. With a lot of actual, uh, the, the idea of some bureaucracies uh, in corrupt countries is let's pay that bureaucracy, bureaucrat a lot of money because if they're corrupt and they're caught taking a bribe, then we fire them and they lose that big wage. And then they have to go work as a taxi driver. Again, right? Unfortunately, what happens typically is you pay them a high wage and they're still corrupt and they still don't get fired, right? But the theory is that you would do that. That's efficiency wages. Why do you just pay them the normal wage and then if they're not good, fire them anyway? Because you want to attract, this is, gets at this first question here, you want to attract ability. So let me, let me get into the definition of ability. So the jargon for ability, um, is called <coughs> adverse selection. Okay? If you have a problem of adverse selection, you have a problem of understanding the ability of the agent you are hiring. That's the definition. Adverse selection is the problem of dealing with the ability of the person you're hiring, right? This term comes from the insurance industry, medical insurance industry, and here's how it works or medical insurance, but think of driving insurance, okay? What that means is that if you're a good driver and you're a safe driver, right, then the insurance company would want to give you a, a, dry, a, a policy against uh, uh, car crashes, for example, right? You, say, you go to them and say, I want an auto insurance policy, I'm a great driver. And they don't necessarily know if you are a good driver or not, right? So, here's... Here's, here's, some of the, here's some of the math, let's say it this way. Say that, I don't want to do this with a lot of graphs, it's actually there's a lot of uh, stuff behind this, theory behind this. So say that the, the price of insurance <coughs> This is 
going on in the healthcare debates right now. Say that the price of insurance is twenty dollars a month for medical. Let's just say it's medical insurance, okay, or driving insurance. Take your pick. Who here would buy medical insurance for twenty bucks a month? You should all raise your hand. It's cheap. Okay. If you actually today went out and tried to buy medical insurance, I don't know what is, what is the does UC Berkeley provide it for undergrads? How much does it cost? Six hundred a semester. So six hundred. That's one hundred fifty dollars a month. So yo, it's a bargain, right? Now, the whole point of insurance is that you pay twenty bucks a month, and if something goes wrong, I take care of you, right? I will pay you money back. So who needs insurance? Do sick, do healthy people need insurance? No, sick people need insurance, right? The sick people are thinking, I'm going to need the insurance, or people who are have a proclivity for being sick, or, or are hypochondriacs actually, they're going to say, I need insurance. Or if you're a bad driver, you're going to say, I need insurance, because I crash my car every couple weeks, right? Now, say it's 20 bucks a month, and you get 100% enrollment, okay? What happens if we raise the price to $200 a month? Who here is going to buy that, or go without, right? I tell you, if you're a crappy driver, it still might be a deal. Right? Or if you're sick, it still might be a good deal. But if you're a good driver, or if you are healthy, it's a bad deal for you because you'd rather keep your money and take your chances in a way. So what happens is there is a, 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 a process of adverse selection so that the only people who end up buying the insurance are the people that are bad drivers or in bad health. Right? People that do not have this ability thing that we're looking for. Okay? And the insurance companies are always worried about adverse selection. They're always worried about how to get the healthy people into the pool. They're trying to get the good drivers into the pool. That's why California has a mandatory auto insurance requirement. That's why health and the health insurance debates in this country are very much paying attention to making sure that everybody has to be covered and everybody has to be paying insurance premium. Because if you had only the sick people buying insurance, then the costs would go up, right? For all of those people, the insurance for them would go up. And the healthy people would be just walking around not, not paying for the other people. I realize that's a cross-subsidy, but the whole point of insurance is actually for unforeseen circumstances. So if you're a healthy person, you get hit by a bus, then you want to have insurance, right? So the, the logic is, is that. Go ahead. Well, to me, I mean, with American healthcare debate, like, what doesn't make a lot of sense is that it seems that everybody just tries to like, the insurance companies try to get all the healthy people for a lot of money. And all the healthy people are not getting it, and all the sick people are trying to somehow lie to the insurance company about whether they smoke, whether they're obese, whether this and that. And it could be solved with just insuring everybody right. mandatory. And then also people wouldn't feel like they need to get their money back. Like I think this other thing people could be. Once I have it, I have to get my money's worth. Right, like I will go to the doctor no matter right. what. And it's really strange. I think that that's a very concise explanation for what should be happening, and what is not happening is that these, uh, essentially, there's a bunch of maneuvering over who's going to get a bigger piece of the pie, right? It doesn't serve it doesn't serve society, but it, the insurance companies are are very interested in making more profits and not uh, making more profits. Period. Right? In fact, they'd be very happy if they only had healthy people paying premium and there was no insurance claims whatsoever. They don't they don't care about people dying, right? So the whole idea is that the system, this, this adverse selection problem can be, be fixed by requiring that everybody have insurance and that the insurers all have an equal share of bad risks, if you want to call it that. Right? That's the whole pre-existing condition thing, which is, there's some outrageous debates about pre-existing conditions right now. And, and mostly they're based on the insurance company saying, uh, oh, you know, you're an obese four-month-old kid, we don't want you, because you might have a heart attack, or whatever the hell the explanation. So this is relevant, obviously, principal agent stuff. Now, what happens next, so you, sit, you get your agent, and your agent has ability or not. You're doing the best you can to filter for ability, but once that agent, you hire that agent, then you have to make sure they put in effort, right? So what if you actually are a good driver, you've got a good driving record, they filter on this, they're saying, okay, adverse selection, how are we gonna do it? Okay, have you had a traffic accident? Or health insurance, do you have a pre-existing condition? Oh, you don't? Okay, we will get you uh, insured. And they're like, yo, I have insurance. You start smoking, you start driving with your eyes closed and texting and stuff like that because you have insurance. Right? Why not? So moral hazard is the word for this.
I mean, I, these words are just the most, the most completely non-intuitive words ever. Moral hazard. Essentially, I don't know, make a sentence, right? You, there's the, the, ha the, the, the hazard that you might have somebody who's immoral and that they're going to do bad things. Think about it any way you want. They're not going to put in effort. They're, they're going to take risks in terms of health. They're going to be lazy if you're a real estate agent. Hey, you know, I'm going to sell the house anyway. I'm going to get my 10 grand. I'm going to sleep in today, right? You're going to be a bad driver if you have insurance. Yeah. So is the moral hazard for the agent or for the principal? This is all about the agent. Okay. The principal at the moment is essentially someone who's out there going, I hope this works, right? We'll get to the principal's responses next, right? So the principal is worrying about these two problems in the agent. But what is it? Selection about the principal? Like, does the agent is the insurance company? No, the other way around. Oh, okay. No, so the, the, the principal, in, in the insurance company situation, the principal is the insurance company. They don't know about the agent who is the insurance buyer, right? It can get very complicated, right? The number of principal agent relationships. Essentially, look at it this way. The principal is always somebody who knows less about the agent than the agent does. It's kind of a tautology, but that's what you have to think about. Who knows more, right? Your boss or the worker? The worker knows more about the worker what the worker is doing, right? The insurance company or the insured person? The insured person knows more about what's going on, right? The voter or the politician? Who's the, po who's the principal and voter politician? Who's the principal? Voters. Voters. The politicians are the agents, believe it or not. So. Don't think of like who gets a bigger salary or what their, their title is or their position is, right? These things are what matter. So we have this expression of moral hazard, which is, even though I hire you as my agent, how are you going to work hard or not? Now, um, the principal has two responses to take care of this situation. In terms of ability, the, the principal can offer what I call, a, uh, the principal wants to create a, um, some kind of filter to find who the correct agent is. Okay? For a real estate agent, it's a shiny car. For someone who's hiring a worker, they look and see, do you have a degree from a college? Right? That's called signaling theory. Right? So someone had a blog post and they mentioned signaling theory. The, the pr real estate agent will put out, an, the real estate agent the size of their car or the cost of their car has nothing to do with how good they are as a real estate agent. But it does advertise success. Right? It advertises that I have done well in the past and therefore I should do well in the future. Your degree from UC Berkeley advertises that you're smart enough to make it through UC Berkeley, to get in and get out of UC Berkeley. So if you say, I have a diploma, then that actually is a signal. Actually, if you know anything, that's irrelevant. Right? They're using that signal, that diploma, as a filter to say, well, you can't be that dumb. You graduated from Berkeley, right? If you graduated from Podunk U, they'd be like, well, Podunk U is not, it's on average, they're not so smart. That literally is a signal of your ability, right? So they will look for signals and pay, and, and they'll offer efficiency wages with this repeated game. That's a way of overcoming a, uh, ability. Well, efficiency wages are kind of a way of overcoming ability and effort. That's a repeated game. But the signaling and filtering is what the agent, the principals are doing. So signal, this is how they counter it or filter. They're the same idea. They're trying to figure out who is good. Okay? In terms of the effort, it's very simple. They just watch you. Right? Monitoring. Monitoring in terms of if you work at a store, they're going to monitor how fast you check out people at the queue. They're going to, um, you know, there's these hidden cameras. They're going to have um, customer complaint box. One of the most early examples of monitoring, which, I, which is still a classic one, is um, uh, $9.99 price for an item. Does anybody know why something costs $9.99? when you see the nine, you actually think it's cheaper even though it's basically that's not the That's not the real reason. Oh, okay. That is a reason, but that's not the bigger reason. So the cashier has to open up the till. Right. So the only way to open up the till is by ringing up the receipt, right? So what happens if it's ten bucks, you say, hey, ten bucks for the phone. The guy's like, cool, you're, you know, and I, I have change. 
very few people show up, show up, very few people show up with $9.99. If they show up with 10, they do want their penny back, right? My penny, right? So I still don't know what happens with gasoline. You know, it's a dollar, it's like two, whatever the hell it is, 243.9. I want to buy a gallon and get my tenth of a penny back. But I've never found out if you can do that. So, uh, but the till, it's, it's so you will ring the till up. So the owner of the store can go out for lunch and someone is ringing up these sales because they have to get change out of the register, right? And then what happens, of course, is the register is recording every sale and you match the beginning cash against the end cash and so it makes sense, right? So the whole idea is to get them to use the till and $9.99 gets them to use the till because the customer wants their penny back. Some stores, they'll say, if you don't get a receipt, you get it for free, right? So if you go up and say, hey, how about I, I get this for 10 bucks? The guy's like, yeah, sure. It's like, hey, can I have a receipt? It's like, oh, no, we don't need a receipt. Oh, then I'll just take it for free. Give me my 10 bucks, right? It's a crazy idea, but it actually is, is the same idea of getting the workers to use the, the till. The tax people, of course, love that because the tax people will tax, put a sales tax based on, on raising things, uh, on, on bringing things up. Okay, so that is um, an overview of uh, the principal agent problem and moral hazard. I want to give you any, uh, more examples of that, but I'm going to skip ahead to uh, homo economicus in the briefing and the midterm. I don't know if I'll get to CSR because I want to make sure I give you guys enough time to go over the homework. I'll come back to the principal agent stuff many times. Do you want to raise start? Uh, yeah, let's let's stop and start. Does that make sense to everybody? By the way, if I said something, does any besides the jargon being horrible? I'm sorry. Yeah. Definition of adverse selection. Adverse selection is that you have the as a principal. You're trying to find an agent with ability, with good ability, right? So the, the problem of adverse selection is you're not sure if someone has good ability or bad ability. Has anybody heard of Joe Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, etc.? He is the one who's actually very well connected with this idea of principal agent theory. He won his Nobel Prize for that work, as far as I can remember. Okay, so let's go to a simple example of homo economicus. I gave you, a, I was talking about the, the, the um, last uh, class I talked about the, uh, the issue of um, the prisoner's dilemma, right? And sequential versus simultaneous games. The prisoner's dilemma is an example of a simultaneous game. And, here, and, and in terms of time, we're going to talk about time a lot in the second half of the semester. And I was trying to manipulate the payoffs in that to make it seem like it would change the actions if it was sequential. That was a bad idea. So here's the way I should really have done it. A trust game is very simple. You've got a person over here, Mr. A, and a person over here, Mr. B. You give Mr. A $10. And you ask Mr. A, Mr. B, this, is, is, this game has been repeated many hundreds of times even. You say to Mr. A, okay, whatever you pass over there, whatever X dollars you pass over there, will be doubled. <coughs> it will become dub two times X. What's going to be left over here is 10 <coughs> minus X, obviously, okay? Now, Mr. B, so here's decision number one. Decision number two is that Mr. B is going to look at 2 times x and pass back, let's call it y, just to be all exciting. And your payoff from this game is going to be 10 minus x plus y. Mr. B's payoff from the game is going to be 2x minus y. Total payoff is going to be 10 plus x.
without using any calculus, what should x be in order to maximize the total payoff? 10, right? What that means is, and both sides know, they both know this set of payoffs. If I pass $10 along, then it becomes $20, and then B is going to choose, back, choose how much to send back. Well, that's the question, right? It's called a trust game. Now, economists have a method of solving games they call it backward induction. Backward induction basically says, let's go backwards, okay? There's two decisions in this game. The first decision is how much is x, and the second decision is how much is y. Right? Y is the second decision. Let's look at the situation if you are Mr. P, and you've got 20 bucks sitting in front of you. Now, if you're homo economicus, a self-interested, zero intrinsic motivation individual, and you receive 20 bucks, and all you care about is money, how much should you pass back? Zero. zero, right? This is called the Econ 1 solution. Right? This is called, oh, I understand what to do, I'll go work at Wall Street and screw everybody. Right? Because I'm somebody's agent, and I'll just screw my principal. This is why this matters. Okay? Or, you know, you can think of a million examples. Now, this is a one-shot game. This is not a repeated game, right? But if somebody passed you 20 bucks, is your inclination to pass back zero or something different than zero? Someone passes you 20 bucks in this game. No. Is it face to face? Maybe, maybe not. Let me do it a different way. You guys all need this. What do the average people do? to play this game. How much do they pass back out of $20? Ten. Ten. The vast majority of people, the modal, the modal return contribution, these are the econ majors, right? Over here you've got the sociologists. <laughs> they pass back 20. But the vast majority of people pass back 10. The guilty sociologists. <laughs> well, okay, so this is the important question. It's called a trust game for a reason, right? If you actually walk in and say, hey guys, today we're going to play a trust game, you start thinking trust, 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 right? If you see the person's face, you will pass back more. I just read something this morning. If, the, if an attractive person knows that you're seeing their face, they will be more trusting. Right? So it's like, wait a second. So there's some attractive person over there, and I can see them or I can't see them. And if they know that I can see that, hold on. So they, they're, uh, that's right, the attractive person is over there, and they're passing me the money. They might pass 20 bucks if they know I can see that. Because, oh, that's a cute person, I'll send it back, right? That's actually true. Right? So this is where economics is, you're not a widget anymore, you're a person, you're an individual, and these things matter. And you, now you understand why people have makeup and plastic surgery and go to the gym and all kinds of stuff, right? So, uh, or they drive flashy cars, right? So that aspect is, so this person, if they send $20, they are trusting, right? And this person, they hope, is trustworthy. Okay? So if you send 20 bucks, then the, the person on the other end, Mr. B, is like, wow, that person is trusting. It doesn't even matter if you kill little babies in the morning. If you send $20, they're like, wow, that person is trusting me. I should act like I am trustworthy. If the maximum that B is going to send back is $10, that is not the maximum. You can send back up to 20. Well, like logically, nobody would send back more than that. Oh, but they uh, do. People are not very logical sometimes. <laughs> but you, well, like if A thinks that that's the maximum that he's going to send back, then why would they just like keep the $10 from the beginning? Right, so that I'll go to backwards induction in a second. Hold your thoughts in a second. 
So backwards induction, the, the homo economicus thing is, whoa, that dude just gave me 20 bucks. I'm keeping it. Right? Now, if you're Mr. A, and you're like, I bet that's an economist over there. If I send 20 bucks, they're going to keep it. I'm not going to send anything. Right? So if you walk in and say, hey, I'm an economist. Who wants to play the trust game with me? Right? No, you're going to end up keeping $10. Right? Or if you're on the other end, you'll get zero. Right? So then, what are you going to do? It's like, oh, I'm not an economist. I actually, I love people. And um, I'm donating my kidney to research because I love people. Send me your money. Right? That's what the preachers do. They get on the air and they cry. Right? Because God will kill them if you don't send them money. So, this is a whole bunch of cheap talk and signaling going on. Right? And the question is, what really does happen? And the vast majority of the time, people will pass across $10 and they'll get $10 back. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll pass across $5. So this person over here ends up with 10 and how much do they pass back? No. No. Three thirty-three, right? Three. They pass back one third. Because then what are the payoffs to each side? Five plus ten it should end up being half and half, but it's not. So if you pack, if you if you do five and then you have ten over here, there's fifteen dollars total is seven fifty. Right? If they get five and they get ten and they pass back a third, it roughly works out to being sharing it out evenly. The whole idea is that people are trying to share the share the money evenly. If you pass 20, ten, they'll give you ten back. If you pass five, they'll give you enough back so that you're essentially fair is fair, even Stephen split, right? That's what it's all about. You split, I choose. It's the birthday cake challenge, right? And this is what happens with the trust game. Yeah. What if you actually have a person, or let's say even most people are um, not about trusting or how to maximize the profit, but just like, I need food. That's just what I need for my life to get through the day, whatever, a cup of coffee. So A says, I need $3 for coffee, means I got seven less and send seven over. And the other person does exactly the same thing. Well, I need to buy this and that, takes that money and just sends it back. Like, what if we actually assume... Well, then if, if, you, if you only need three on either side, and you pass seven across, seven becomes 14, now you've got 11 extra that you really don't need. Right. So you might as well split the what you don't need with the other person. <coughs> you keep three and you send back six and a half. And you keep the other six and a half. Or a five and a half. But you wouldn't know that, that the other person would Who cares? Know. That's what happens. Right? I mean, the problem really is getting inside someone else's head. This is, this is in a sense, why this is all game theory. Yeah. Alright, so this is like 10 and 20 dollars, right? Yeah. So there's not that much impact. What happens when you do it with a thousand dollars? Ten thousand dollars. They've actually done it with very large amounts of money. The, the thing that they, the experimentalists do is they go to developing countries, where they can put like a month wages on the table. And people still trade. They still are trusting. But isn't the mentality different? Well, I don't think so. They're humans there, too. <laughs> In fact, they're not economic economists, so they're usually nicer. <laughs> yes, there's actually a really good paper. Um, I will send you the link to this paper. Uh, talk about, un someone said unnecessary readings. Everything I tell you is necessary if you want to understand economics. But I'll send you a link to this uh, famous paper. Uh, the, the Heinrich. It's, a mul it's a paper with studies across societies. It's an anthropologist. Um, and what they found is that in um, societies that are very individualistic, hunter-gatherer societies, that when they play the trust game, it would be like, I killed it, it's mine. right? It's my 20 bucks, I'm going to keep them. But the societies, interestingly, where there was more trade, because of just literally trading, uh, the, there was much more sharing or, or trusting going on. right? So unfortunately, y'all have no excuses for keeping all the money, because you don't belong to a hunter-gatherer society. But they have, the anthropologists, actually anthropologists ran these experiments, because they had to go, like they've been living in the jungle for 12 years and they played the game. So there is, there are some cross-cultural differences, but pretty much everybody that has, that exists in a market society, which includes pretty much everybody, like over 95% of the people on the planet, including the Chinese, including the Indians, including the Russians, right, they will uh, be uh, aware of all the same um, Incentives and, 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 and social norms that we are aware of right here. Another question, on the other hand? Yeah. So, if you, but if you assume that you played it one more time, or like that you might need that person eventually yes. again, 
then wouldn't you return from the twenty dollars? You would return eleven, right? Because Potentially, yeah. I mean, wouldn't you want to ensure that the other person has more to do with the game? Yeah. Well, that's if you if you're not sure if the game's going to be repeated. So if it's not repeated, you try to even it out. In some and ways. if you going to possibly repeat it, you're trying to make sure that he has some incentive to do it again. Right, right. The thing is, is that no matter what you tell people when you're running these experiments, you say, this is a one-shot game, I've done it. You walk in there, everybody's got an envelope, you walk out of the room, you'll never see that person again, right? And even so, people will share. This is the whole idea. Why do people tip at restaurants when they're driving across country, right? In some ways, we're socialized to do it. It is a norm, but this is actually goes back to evolutionary psychology and economists are ripping that off right now. Evolutionary psychology is that if you were in a cooperative tribe, you beat the hell out of the tribe of homo economicus. Because they're all running around, oh my god, they have big uh, spears, let's run. And that one person would run, the whole tribe would be decimated, and now they're extinct. But the tribe that would cooperate would beat them up. And so cooperation is actually an involved, evolved psychological, or God gave it to us, it's a psychological belief that we all have. It is extremely strong. Right? You find that people, when they play these games, if there's a third party in there, and someone passes along like $2, and the third party is allowed to punish that person, they will. Right? They will spend their own money to punish that person. Because they don't like cheaters. Right? It's called cheater detection. Right? One of the most strongest things, things we have as humans is the cheater detection principle. And it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, like, people will do stuff, they'll, they'll literally, like, take a quart of blood out of my veins. I want to kill that person. You know, they will actually sacrifice a lot to hurt somebody. They will, to hurt somebody who is doing something that is unfair or unjust. They don't want to hurt somebody who's being cool, right? In fact, they might reward, if you let them punish or reward, they might pile rewards on the person who's more, more trusting than normal, right? These experiments are very, very um, deep in terms of their results. Like, there's almost no, con there's no, almost no uh, doubt about it, let's say it that way. Okay. And, and, and luckily humans are kind of, kind of nice to each other in the experiments. Oh crap, the briefing and the uh, turn. Okay, so, I am going to, I have to give it back the midterm. Uh, the briefing is due on the 10th. Um, the 10th. What, day of the, what day of the week is the 10th? Does anybody have a calendar handy? Tuesday. So next Tuesday, so two, to, two weeks from now, is that Tuesday? Yeah. Roughly? Okay, next Tuesday I'll tell you about the briefing. Because I want to give you guys uh, an assignment at the same time. I have two weeks to complete it. Let's go over the homework for a second. I'm going to go over some of the stuff, and then um, we'll get him back your, your midterms. Um, first of all, any last minute questions about this principle agent stuff? We'll, we'll get to this many, many times, don't worry. Okay, so the, the distribution of grades uh, was, it kind of had this shape. <laughs> Whoops, do that right. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, not a bell curve. It kind of had a longer tail this way, okay? So the, the median was 10.5, and the mean was below it. 10.1. The reason the mean was below it is because more people did worse, right? They would pull down the average score. But 50% of you got more than 10.5, and 50% of you got less than 10.5. That's 70%, which is not crazy. That's pretty good. I mean, not for people that got less, but that's pretty good as a class uh, average. Um, as usual, remember that you have. Uh, once you get your midterm back, if you have questions about your grade, you have one week to turn back a request for a regrade in writing typed. Right? That means a week from today. So um, let me go over quickly um, some of the most common problems. Uh, the ones that people miss on the true false, the deadweight loss from attacks, it is more than just the triangle. Okay? It has to do with the lobbying around the creation of the tax, where the tax money might be spent. That kind of political economy stuff that I was trying to pound into you guys, right? Deadweight loss is not just that triangle. The key has a longer explanation. The other one that people got wrong uh, more often than not, or whatever, had trouble with, 
A firm should grow as long as the marginal benefit to the managers exceeds the marginal cost they experience. True or false? False, false right? The, man the firm is, a, is functioning for profits, not for the managers. Although many managers will run them for their own personal interests. Okay? The other one, uh, the last two were difficult. Markets are more efficient than bureaucracies at allocating goods and services because they use prices. True or false? False. They're often more efficient, but they might not be more efficient. That's what the whole theory of the firm is all about. Right? Why do you have a firm if markets are so awesome? Right? You have firms because they help coordinate in situations where the transactions cost of prices are high. Most markets are efficient because they achieve equilibrium. True or false? False. Right? Almost all, no markets are in equilibrium. Markets are efficient because they facilitate exchange and trade. Um, as I mentioned, the key, the key is already posted actually in vSpace. Um, the problem that people had on the Edgeworth box is that um, they didn't understand that the initial endowment from both sides is actually going to be at the same point. So my endowment, if I'm over here, is the same. It's just the reflection of the endowment of B over there, right? Because the total sum of goods in the economy is fixed. So what I don't have, you have, and what you don't have, I have, right? So it had to be the same point. Indifference curves should pass through this point, and if they're perfect substitutes, they're going to be straight lines. That was a problem. On um, question three, people didn't understand how to do the, trans, uh, the, the total cost curve. Question three, whoa, whoa. oh, total, no, total, total cost function, mostly because I was messing with your minds by giving everything in inverted form. We had to transform everything into the other size in order to get the correct total cost curve. I will leave that to you to look at the key in terms of doing the math. Um, in question four, there was a, that was their cost curve. Good news for you is that you'll see that cost curve many more times in economics bad news is that the first time you saw it, maybe, was on this exam, <coughs> right? If this is total revenue, is there market power? Does this firm have market power? Does price change as you sell more quantity? No. The slope is constant. It's a line. No market power. The cost curve had this shape, okay? This point... Is that profit maximizing or minimizing? Profit minimizing. Your total cost is higher than your total revenues, right? And it's tangent there. So that is the worst you can do. This point, on the other hand, is profit maximizing. Okay? That was something that people had trouble with. This is a break-even point. This point here is also where you switch from... Um, this is increasing returns to scale. This is decreasing returns to scale. Right? Costs are going up at an increasing rate. Right? So that's increasing prices, but decreasing returns to scale. Scale and, and cost are inverted. Right? It's a bitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Theory of the firm, you'll have plenty of time to see it. Let's pass back these exams, stop the tape.